Hi, everybody. Welcome to a special edition of Coffee, Current Events, and Politics in Lukeman Nation. The most dangerous show on social media anywhere. So we are very excited because we have a special guest today. As you can see, our special guest is our friend and our comrade, Margaret Kimberly. For those of you who do not know who Margaret Kimberly is, tell us a little bit about Margaret. Okay, Jackie. Uh, Margaret Kimberly is a New York-based writer and activist for peace and justice issues. She has been a columnist for Black Agenda Report since its inception and was for four years the weekly columnist for Black Agenda, um, for Black Commentator. Her work has also appeared in the Dallas Morning News, the Chicago Defender, and on websites such as Alternet, Counterpunch, Tom Paine, along with others. Um, and she has written several books, too. And the latest book is Prejudential. I love that title because it is, I think, a perfect encapsulation uh, of what the presidency, the entirety of the presidency of the United States is. So, Margaret Kimberly, welcome to Coffee Current Events and Politics and Lukeman Nation. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Oh, thanks. It's great to be back. So yeah, it has been a while, hasn't it? It's been yeah, it a, has like a year. Yeah, I mean there it has been that long. I mean so <laughs> much has happened since the last time we talked. Um and there there's just too much stuff to cover um everything, but the only thing I want to talk about today is your book. Yes. Um please tell us about Prejudential, why you titled it that way and what that title means. Well, this, this project began when I, I wrote a Black Agenda Report column about Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I had watched a public television documentary about him and the Roosevelt family, and it was, uh, pun intended, a, um, a whitewash of his racism and his imperialism. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, a friend and supporter of Black Agenda Report suggested, he said, write about all the presidents. And I took on this task, not, not knowing how, how, uh, what it would be, mm-hmm. but sometimes that's good in life to say yes to things when you don't know what you're getting into, <laughs> maybe you wouldn't achieve as much, but, um, the title Prejudential was the idea of the publishers at Steerforth Press, they wanted to come up with something, um, well, that would be memorable, something pithy, and it, the, it not only is a catchy word, but it sums up uh, what I've been uh, saying in this 45-chapter book, uh, chapter for each president, uh, and the book tells um, the reader that um, that anti-black racism is foundational to this country. America was founded as a settler colonial state. One of the reasons the, uh, the people who are called founding fathers, that they wanted to break away from Britain, is they wanted to make sure that uh, um, that there would be no obstacles to them expanding across the continent to the continue, uh, continuation of the slave trade. They were afraid the British might uh, end it, and they, they ultimately did. Uh, they wanted to expand as far as they could into indigenous lands. The British did not want them to do that. The French, the Spanish still had territories on the continent, and that would have created uh, problems for the British. Uh, but these people wanted it all, and uh, they, the, you know, it's very interesting. The Declaration of Independence mentions the British king, uh, that King George was stirring up the Indians against them, and that's something we're not taught in mm, school. Right. Um, uh, the book is full of information that we are not taught. Um, the biographers, the scholars are more, frankly, more concerned with defending the system we have than in telling the truth about their subject matter. So they either lie outright or they omit. And I think it's important to point out that an omission is a lie. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you write about George Washington and you don't say that he and Martha own several hundred people, if you don't say that they chased down one young woman, managed to escape, uh, and they chased her down, they were determined to try to get her back. Um, and to not say that the reason the uh, capital, a new capital city was built between Maryland and Virginia is that they wanted a capital that was safely 
within the confines of the plantation economy. If you don't say that George Washington had a pro personal problem because uh, uh, Pennsylvania had a law that any enslaved person who was in the state for more than six months was free, he rotated his enslaved people. He made sure nobody was in, when the capital was in Philadelphia, that no one was there for uh, six months. And as that time approached, he rotated people from Mount Vernon to Philadelphia. So when those things are omitted, when you don't, you repeat the lie that Abraham Lincoln gave up his dream of colonization, that is to say, sending black people out of the country, when you don't tell the truth that he never gave that up, that as late as a week before he was assassinated, he was still talking about that plan, that there actually was a colony established on a small island off the coast of Haiti, Ila Vash, uh, mm -hmm. Cal Island. They said 400 uh, newly freed people there. Um, the colony failed. They brought them back. But um, uh, these are things we are not taught in school. Uh, we are not taught that FDR and John F. Kennedy uh, had to mollify the Southern segregationists who were Democrats, lest we forget, mm -hmm. and that the little bit they may have done was because of uh, the demands of black people. Now, let's, now, now let's talk about um, three of the uh, presidents outside of uh, Abraham Lincoln, but in our time, mm -hmm. three of the uh, presidents who are probably um, most beloved by black people, John F. Kennedy, uh, let's talk about um, Jimmy Carter, and um, the, the first black president. The real first black president or the first black black <laughs> the, the, the first, not the, the real first black president, but okay, yeah, okay. yeah, not yet. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I'm glad you said that. Let's include Bill Clinton and then Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. So in our lifetime, uh, well, John F. Kennedy's a little bit for me, but but in yeah. but in in our the, our modern history, um, these are probably the presidents most beloved by black people. So could you explain to us where they fit in in this anti-black narrative? Well, as as, as I was saying, Kennedy uh, depended upon the Southern segregationists. He chose Johnson as his running mate because mm. he was a Southerner. Um, the, uh, that was how you balanced the ticket, a northerner and a southerner. Uh, he uh, did not defend the Freedom Riders. They, he and his brother, Robert Kennedy, the attorney general, considered the civil rights movement a uh, hindrance, mm. uh, an annoyance to them. They, um, at every turn, whenever they had an opportunity to protect people, uh, they would choose not to. Um, when they finally did... Uh, do the little that they did, it's because the movement demanded it. Mm. Martin Luther King's first meeting with John F. Kennedy was in secret. That's uh, how afraid they were of being connected with this new uh, movement demanding human rights. Bobby Kennedy hated the March on Washington. He thought it was going to be used against his, uh, against his brother. Kennedy finally gave a speech, uh, and he said so civil rights was a moral issue, not a political issue. Of course, it was a very political issue. That was a lie. But uh, the little that he did, there was some tepid uh, civil rights legislation um, uh, involving uh, corporations that had um, any federal funding. But it was very limited. But even that much was because of the movement. That's certainly true of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, the movement really reached its, uh, its zenith during his term in office. That's why he shepherded through the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, not because he um, uh, was a friend to black people at all. And I, I want to tell one story about 1964, the Democratic Convention, and Fannie Lou Hamer was trying to get, and others were trying to get the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party seated at the convention. Right. Linda mm -hmm. Johnson took her off the air. That's she right. Was giving mm -hmm. this riveting speech about uh, uh, the terrible oppression in Mississippi and the vicious beating she received. And they cut her off. And Johnson, they preempted her. And Johnson came on with some BS about the first anniversary of Kennedy's assassination approaching. He just didn't want her on the air. Mm. Uh, Bobby Kennedy gave. Hoover, permission to surveil uh, Martin Luther King and others. During this convention that I just referred to, the FBI had everybody under surveillance. Mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson knew what everybody said, what everybody was doing. Uh, Bill Clinton, 
uh, so-called new Southern Democrat, was the same old Democrat, uh -huh. he left the campaign trail to execute a black man who was mentally disabled, uh, the Sister Soul John moment where uh, race baiting Jesse Jackson in public. Um, and uh, when he became president, let's look at, uh, and, and also the Stone Mountain moment, uh, something right. that isn't talked about enough. Uh, as the Super Tuesday primary approached, he had a photo op at a uh, jail in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Stone Mountain is the location of a huge uh, relief sculpture in the, in the, in the stone of uh, Robert E. Lee mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Stonewall uh, Jackson. And it's the uh, home of uh, the KKK, the place where the KKK was resurrected. And uh, Clinton put these black mostly black prisoners on display to talk about how tough he was on crime. As president, he's the one who ended the 60-year right. Uh, from the days of FDR, there was a right to public assistance. He got rid of it and threw millions of people deeper into poverty. Yeah. Obama, um, he was as much a white supremacist as the white presidents. He often would uh, go out of his way to scold the black people, to talk about black men being irresponsible. Whenever he was, his first, uh, the first time he became known to most of the public was during the 2004 Democratic Convention. He was about to run for the Senate seat in Illinois, mm -hmm. and he gave a, a primetime speech, and among other things, he said, uh, there is no black America, there is no white America. And of course that's a lie. Mm -hmm. But his goal was to make it clear that there wouldn't be any black politics. And by that I mean uh, politics that would assert our rights, that would assert our needs. And he was reassuring uh, white people and reassuring the rich people who decide who is going to be president that there would be no black agenda uh, in his public life. And he made good on that as president. He bailed out the banks as soon as he came into office. They are the ones who created the financial crisis. He did not bail out the people, the black people who lost their homes, the only wealth most black people ever mm -hmm. uh, get in life. Uh, his foreign policy, he's the one who destroyed uh, Libya, yeah. an African nation, mm -hmm. turned it into an open uh, slave market state. So uh, those are some of the examples, that, and that's just the modern era. Jimmy Carter, <laughs> right, you mentioned right. Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. uh, during his campaign, he referred to maintaining ethnic purity of neighborhoods mm -hmm. right. and uh, uh, said he was, a, at that time, school busing for the purposes of integration was a hot issue, and he said he was opposed to uh, forcing uh, busing on white people, the ones they were after, all the ones who opposed it. So those are just some examples from the modern era of how um, uh, presidents have interacted with and treated black people. Well, uh, and, 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 and the follow-up question, mm -hmm. if I may ask. Now, we, we talk about, what, 46 presidents now? Uh, like 45. 45. 45 presidents. Yeah. What, why do you think, um, uh, uh, Margaret, that, that this anti-blackness was an overall theme through all of these presidencies? Why no one broke away from that? Because that's the foundation of the country. From the days of the Constitution, the, the clause that says that uh, uh, black people were to be counted as, as three-fifths in order to maintain the power of the slaveocracy, that theme continued of um, uh, one section of the country asserting, clearly overtly asserting its uh, rights of uh, white supremacy, and the other portions of the country going along with them. Uh, you can't have a, a nation where uh, the first uh, of the first 12 presidents, 10 were slaveholders. Mm. That tells you uh, how important uh, this institution was. And then even after it ended, the impetus was to continue controlling black people, physically controlling black people's lives and um, doing everything to subvert our legal rights. That's not something that's going to end. And it certainly can't end when you lie about it. Uh, so that slavery was there was re reconstruction was all too brief. Then we had nearly 100 years of Jim Crow segregation, uh, the liberation movement. Uh, we succeeded in getting the right to vote. We succeeded in passing uh, the Civil Rights Act. But the response to that was to start the mass incarceration state. Right. Uh, we now have two million people 
in jail and half of them are black. I read recently that when Martin Luther King was alive mm. in 1968, there were only 600,000 some odd people incarcerated. There are now three times as many. So that was their response. And uh, it is our charge to study this past and to figure out how to continue the struggle knowing what we already know about our history. And that includes, and it's especially important now, during a presidential election campaign, and we are constantly told that this person or that person is the one who is best for us, the one who will protect us, uh, and it hasn't gotten us very far. Uh, we stuck with the Democrats who were, because of their own corruption, were too incompetent to defeat Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And uh, we surely must uh, break with these people, break with this party, they are now trying to force Michael Bloomberg either, either as president or as the kingmaker mm -hmm. uh, upon us, and that will be a disaster. You know, Margaret, uh, you are familiar with Bloomberg and his administration, and I think this book is uh, timely, especially because he seems to be the uh, candidate that the Democratic Party is now throwing their weight behind because he has been able to make some kind of bizarre resonance uh, with, uh, they think that he's made some type of resonance, uh, uh, resonance rather, with some black voters despite his record. So what we have to already tell the truth about uh, candidates and their anti-black policies before they even become president now. So can you illuminate, for people who are not aware, some of Mike Bloomberg's uh, serious anti-black policies as mayor of New York? Yeah, as a, and it's a funny thing. He was preceded as mayor by Rudy Giuliani, who was a very racist man. Mm -hmm. But Bloomberg ended up being worse. Uh, I first, um, shortly after he came into office, uh, a police officer, a, a, a black woman, told me, that the pressure to make arrests was much worse under Bloomberg than under Giuliani. Wow. Wow. And uh, we know about the stop and frisk policies, uh, several million cases where people were stopped for no reason in violation of the law. Uh, finally, they had to amend the policy because of, uh, of lawsuits. But uh, we had people whose lives were ruined, who were thrown into jail, who lost their jobs, he accelerated gentrification, displacing black people from the city of New York. And by the way, no one talks about his role in the uh, case of the Central Park Five, the five uh, teens uh, who spent many years in jail, um, uh, a wrongful uh, conviction for rape. Bloomberg kept them from being compensated. Mm -hmm. Their wow. convictions were vacated the year he came into office. They, they did not get paid the millions of dollars they were owed until uh, uh, de Blasio became mayor. Uh, so it was mm -hmm. a directive straight from him that they were not going to be compensated. And everyone talks about Trump uh, and his newspaper ad against the Central Park Five, and we should, but nobody talks about how he was the man who personally intervened and prevented them from getting justice uh, after the in injustice was um, uh, made uh, made public and was known, so uh, that's what we get with uh, with Bloomberg. We get someone who will not be a um, uh, overtly racist in his public comments. He will make friends with the the right black people. He's getting endorsements from black mayors. But that's because he's rich. He's a billionaire, exactly. yep. uh, fifty a real billionaire, not like Trump. Um, <laughs> and uh, money talks. He's already bought off the Democratic Party. They've already changed their rules to allow him into debates. And uh, this is a um, an omen of bad things to come. I believe Bloomberg becoming president or choosing the president will be as bad for black people, if not worse, than Trump and his rednecks. Wow. You know, it, it's interesting that uh, when people talk about the assault on uh, public assistance uh, and social safety net programs that have happened under Clinton, that have happened, uh, uh, <laughs> bless you, um, in, you know, locally 
uh, in states uh, like in uh, um, or cities like under Bloomberg, people forget that that does come from and you and you mentioned it that uh, that those benefits do come from FDR out of his second Bill of Rights. That now even FDR had his problems, and this is a conversation I've had with a couple of people who say that the New Deal wasn't inherently racist. Okay, it may not have been written to be racist, but it was certainly implemented with racial bias uh, in the states. But since we brought up FDR, tell us a little bit about uh, our favorite, (laughs) bless you, our favorite first uh, socialist so-called president. Uh, Well, you know, FDR was also a Democrat, and at the time the Democrats were the party of the segregated South. So he would, he never did anything to help pass anti-lynching legislation. Mm. Uh, Anti-lynching legislation was never passed. People tried for decades. And he always said, my hands are tied, I need the South. So he did not do uh, um, what people most needed at the time. He did have some tepid civil rights legislation related, related to employment for the defense industries, But that's because A. Philip Randolph threatened to have a march on Washington. That was a response to a a black political demand. Uh, um, Many of his programs were administered by the states, and that meant black people would be discriminated against. Even the Social Security Act, initially uh, agricultural work and domestic work were excluded. And what did most black, then as now, most black people lived in the South, and guess what most of them did? So um, there were uh, smaller groups of black people who uh, were able to benefit. Uh, the GI Bill, which I, I believe was after he, uh, he died uh, towards the end of the war, the GI Bill was administered by the states. And what do you think that meant for black people? So there were many black veterans who were cheated out of their benefits and who never uh, got them at all. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, at the time, uh, black people were... Uh, rendered so invisible that her being friends with Mary McLeod Bethune was a big thing. Mm. But even she, uh, she used black people for photo ops. She she wrote a column called If I Were a Negro, mm. and she said, uh, if I were a Negro, I might be filled with bitterness, but uh, I also wouldn't ask for too much. I wouldn't push too far, and I would be glad my people were taken from Africa. Wow. wow. <laughs> yes, yes. So so that's what you got with, uh, with the... Um, the Roosevelt's. Well, what would you say, um, and this would be my uh, last question, well, not the last question, but you know, Mm -hmm. but what would you say about um, uh, people who make excuses for the early presidents by saying, oh, well, they were just men of their time. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, even at that time, there were people, many people questioned the rightness of slavery, or who who called it wrong. Uh, And there's an example of... uh, a man named Edward Coles, he was uh, related to the Madisons. He was the secretary to Jefferson and to Madison, a uh, Virginian, a slaveholder. And he left the state. He went to Illinois and freed the people he owned. Uh, Tadeusz Kosciuszko, who was a Polish uh, army officer who fought with the revolution, he left money in his will to Jefferson because Jefferson, being a hypocrite, would always claim he thought slavery was wrong, but he would always say, well, but I can't afford it. So Kosciuszko left him money in his will, and he said uh, that his, it was his part of his bequest for uh, Jefferson to use the money to free enslaved people. Wow. Well, cut to the chase, he never did. He so he though. never <laughs> used that money to do what Kosciuszko asked him to do. He kept so I bring it, though. up those cases of people of that time. Uh, who said that slavery was wrong. There were always ra- uh, abolitionists, but uh, the people in power were in power because they went along with the system. That was uh, the way to... So so many of the early presidents were Virginians. That was the center mm-hmm. of uh, political power in the country. So they, if they didn't profit from slavery themselves... They um, reached that high office and that position of influence because they went along with it. So even those who didn't own uh, enslaved people uh, were in favor of uh, manifest destiny of spreading uh, across the continent, stealing Indian lands, uh, the Louisiana Purchase, and, and so on. 
they all were uh, responsible for that in some to some degree. Okay, honestly, last question. <laughs> so, you know, th- this looks like such a daunting task, and we are facing an election that, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, this is the most important election of our time. You know, we have to, you know, even if we don't like the Democratic candidate, we have to vote for whoever the Democratic candidate is to get rid of this particular president. Um, you know, what do we tell people who have that attitude that it doesn't matter who the Democratic president is, we have to vote for, or the Democratic candidate rather is, we have to vote for that candidate to get rid of this particularly bad Republican president. From your perspective, what's the answer for people uh, when they say that? And then I want you to tell us how we can get your vote. Well, I would say that uh, we have to stop being passive. This business of black people just sitting around and waiting for, um, first of all, believing that a particular person is more electable, that is to say, can beat Trump. So we were told for months it was Joe Biden. Joe Biden is a train wreck. Uh, he can't even, he's horrible. He, there is, he's coming in dead last in these uh, first uh, races. But uh, people, and we kept hearing about he had so much black support, well, that was a result of people being told he was the one to beat Trump. Mm. Right. There's no reason to sit back and just passively accept what we're told about electability. The first thing to do is determine what do we want? What mm. do we want candidates to say? What are the red lines that they can't cross with us? We have to assert some self-determination first. Because listening, and we were told Hillary Clinton was a shoe in There's no way Trump would win. And Trump won. <laughs> So uh, mm-hmm. the last thing we should be doing is just listening to these uh, talking heads and accepting what they say. We have to, we can determine who's electable. Um, and uh, I also want to say that it's important, one of the things that comes out from this book is Trump is not an anomaly. He's not the first president to um, evoke racist Trumps or make racist statements. He. He does that more. He was never a professional politician, so he doesn't uh, obey those niceties. But let's not forget, Ronald Reagan talked about welfare queens and strapping young bucks Mm -hmm. using uh, food stamps and talked about states' rights. Jimmy Carter talked about ethnic purity, what Clinton did. I mean, I could go on. Uh, He's just the one with the the worst manners. But (laughs) we have to be active in this process. We cannot just accept that because Bloomberg is rich, he can win, and therefore we should accept him without making any demands or taking the chance to say, we're not voting for him. I mean, and really meaning it and turning our backs on these so-called leaders who just fell down and worshipped him when he started writing some checks. Mm -hmm. That um, That is a route to disaster. We've already seen when Obama was president, the Democrats lost nearly a thousand seats across the country, state legislatures and Congress. So the Democrats aren't even very good at getting elected. There's no reason to be so afraid and to think that we cannot ask them any questions or make any demands. Uh, That's what got us Trump, uh, Mm. is listening to these, uh, these people who are so compromised who do not really pose any opposition to the Republican Party. We have to stop being so afraid, and we have to look at our condition no matter who the president is. There were a million black people in jail before Trump. Um, Obama is the one who deported the most people of any president. Uh, Trump still hasn't reached the levels of deportations that Obama did. Mm -hmm. Look at what they've done around the world to uh, African people. So we need to stop being so afraid of Trump, stop paying attention to his stupid tweets, <laughs> and um, assert that we have power. We still, the system does give us some little power, and we have to use it. So how do we get a copy of Prejudential? How do people get a copy of your book? And where can they read your work on a regular basis? Uh, you can read my work every week in blackagendareport.com. You can order the book from uh, the publisher steerforthpress.com, uh, and it's also on uh, on Amazon. And I just wanted to just um, comment. I've read a lot of the reviews of your book, 
<laughs> I haven't read a bad one yet, you know. And yeah. so, I'm, and that's just to encourage the audience members out there. Please get this book if you're yes. really about this work. If you're really about truth. If you're really about um, understanding um, um, uh, what's behind the curtain, mm-hmm. um, please get this book. I I, I must have read about five or six reviews so far, uh, <laughs> and um, all of them, all of them uh, praises this book. Very good work. Yeah, we have been reading through it. Uh, this weekend, starting uh, front, what's today? Sunday. We've been reading through it this weekend, starting for, like Friday night, and we are thoroughly, oh, yeah. thoroughly oh, enjoying it. Yeah. Yes, thoroughly you enjoying it. You won't, you won't, <laughs> be, you won't be disappointed. You get a copy of this book, you won't be disappointed. And and I'm telling you, I mean, um, people may think I'm a reader. You know, I'm not as much a reader as people may think I am. But I mean, um, <laughs> but I mean, your work. Um, and I, I mean, even, I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, devolve into, you know, fandom, but I am a fan and <laughs> no, I, yeah, 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 and I am a fan. And I, and I remember one piece that you wrote and I was like, Oh my God, I wish I could write like that. <laughs> and, 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 and what encouraged me was when you responded and say, Hey, just keep practicing. You can. And that's what encouraged me to start writing uh, my first novel, you mm-hmm. know? So, very uh, good. All I want to, you. you know, I'm not a, I did was not a didn't get a degree in journalism I just have been writing for a long time Mm -hmm. like a gender report gave me this opportunity and uh, I I think it's important we need to hear more stories we there's so many people who have so many things that are important let's utilize the internet uh, while it's still available to (laughs) us do these things I'm also on Twitter freedom ride blog Um, and uh, we should encourage each other Um, We have an opportunity for people who uh, don't necessarily have these opportunities, such as yourselves, to have a podcast, to do interviews, and we have to be in solidarity and encourage each other as much as possible because we all have knowledge that needs to be shared with others. Absolutely. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. We know you have an event this evening. Um, and we wish you much success, not just with your event this evening, but with the rest of your book book launch. And we, we absolutely hope that it does very, very well because it is a very good book, some incredible information. And thank you so much for joining us. Yep. Thank you both. And thanks for joining us here on a special edition, yeah, special edition of Coffee Current Events and Politics in Luke Mon Nation. The most dangerous show on social media. Anywhere. Thanks so much, (laughs) y'all. Peace. I love your...